Hello and welcome back to the Shaky Sonnet Show. I am Too Tight Lutrec, the drag laureate of the sanitarium, and we are here in the sanitarium at the bottom of the down staircase in the permanently sequestered remainder section of an unnamed local library which may or may not have some lean and hungry lions cou crouching on the front steps waiting to gobble up another discussion of Shakespeare's sonnets while I sit here demurely sipping my non-caloric, non-alcoholic, but delightful drink. As I flip open my book to, oh, what a coincidence, Sonnet 75, which just happens to be the sonnet we're set to talk about today. And yes, that Sonnet 75, the one that comes after Sonnet 74, and before Sonnet 76 in the 1609 quarto version. But for some reason, um, some editors question the placement of Sonnet 75 because it shares some qualities thematically and linguistically with other sonnets, and they wonder if, in fact, it belongs in this spot between 74 and 76. There is one scholar named H.C. Beeching, um, who in the, his 1609, I'm sorry, 1604 edition of the sonnets, says that this sonnet would come after sonnet 52, and sonnet 52 is that Carcanet sonnet, is what I'll call it. Um, there's another scholar named C.K. Pooler, who in a 1918 edition suggests that 75 is an envoy or a send-off, to sonnets 56 to 74, which at least puts it in the correct position after 74. Then, Hyder Edward Rollins, my main man, if you've been following, in his amazing Variorum, directs us to volume two of the Variorum. So the, the volume one of the Variorum uh, gives all of the sonnets with the particular scholars and what they have noted throughout the the centuries, I suppose, up until 1944 when the very volume was published. And volume two is more extensive commentary on those scholars and particular issues in the, um, in the sonnets. So he points us to the organizational chapter where, lo and behold, he lists 20, two zero other editors who have positioned the sonnets in completely different order than appears in the 1609 quarto version. And I find that a little bit, a little bit ridiculous. But for the moment, we'll stick with the, the latest chronology of the sonnets um, by recent scholars, Edmondson and Wells in particular, and if we're going to be talking about the chronology, but for our purposes, we'll be sticking with Shakespeare's 1609 quarto for the true order of the science in which we'll read it. And I don't particularly find comparisons of themes in science a convincing way to go about grouping science to begin with, because all writers have obsessions that they come to over and over and over again, and not, I contend, because they're lazy, necessarily, nor because they lack imagination, necessarily, but because they're attempting to work through their obsessions. Number one, until they find out that they've got it just right. Two, to exhaust every facet, every possible facet of that obsession. Or three, literally to wear it out so that it has no more force or power or interest for them in their work or in their psyche. And it turns out that, lo and behold, love and sex and food, surprise, surprise, are common obsessions of many people. And so perhaps we'll find some reference to those in Sonnet 75. Let's just take a look and find out. And oh yes, check, 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 there they all are. Love, sex, food. I'll read Sonnet 75 for you, and you'll see what I mean, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Sonnet 
Sonnet 75 So are you to my thoughts as food to life, or as sweet seasoned showers are to the ground, and for the peace of you I hold such strife as twixt a miser and his wealth is found. Now proud as an enjoyer, and anon doubting the filching age will steal his treasure, now counting best to be with you alone, then bettered that the world may see my pleasure. Sometime all full with feasting on your sight, and by and by clean starved for a look, possessing or pursuing no delight save what is had or must from you be took. Thus do I pine and surfeit day by day, or gluttoning on all, or all away. So I think this sonnet is pretty clear, but we'll go through it line by line and see what we can find out. There's a nice little set of oppositions as we go along. So are you to my thoughts as food to life. You feed me like food. Or as sweet seasoned showers are to the ground. You water me like rain. And for the peace of you, I hold such strife. And here we have the opposition of peace and strife, where my peace is disturbed by worrying about someone disturbing my peace. For the, pe for the peace of you, I hold such strife, strife as twixt a miser and his wealth is found. So we have the idea of a, a, a miser who hoards money and is so anxious about keeping it that he doesn't know what to do with it. He loves it, but he doesn't want to depart from it. And so it sets up a bit of a conundrum. And this sets up the idea, this sort of ladder-like uh, system of opposites as we go along to, to intensify the idea of, of hunger or desire. And it's sort of along the themes of hunger is the best sauce, which was said by somebody. Um, I looked it up and tried to figure it out. And it's, it's attributed to Socrates. It's attributed to Cicero. Maybe Cervantes said it. Perhaps too tight Lautrec said it 6,000 years ago, because I don't know. I don't remember what I said yesterday, much less 6,000 years ago. So someone said hunger is the best sauce, and that seems to be the theme of this sonnet. So in the second quatrain, we have this now, now, and then. Again, this back and forth thing up the ladder so that we get the opposites intensifying the desire. Now proud is an enjoyer. And anon, doubting, doubting here being fearing, doubting the filching age will steal his treasure. I want to sit back and just adore, adore you because I could just look and look and look and look. But I'm also kind of sitting here afraid that someone's going to take you from me. Now, counting best to be with you alone, then better that the world may see my pleasure. And that's quite a nice little... Um, escalation from best, which you think you can go no higher than that, and yet bettered still, um, you do go higher. And this idea that I'd like to sit back and just enjoy you, or be with you alone, but better yet, let's go take a stroll around the town and I can show everybody my little trophy here um, on my arm and, and say, yes, this is mine. And do a couple strolls around town just to show everyone. Even though I love being with you alone, I kind of like it when I show everyone everything that I've got, meaning you. Which is sort of a strange thing, but understandable. I think we've all been there. For the third quatrain, quatrain sometime all full with feasting on your sight, and by and by clean starved for a look. I could eat you up, basically. Um, when you're here, I look and look and look, Yum. And when you're not here, I'm starved for a look at you. Um, possessing or pursuing no delight. Possessing or pursuing no delight, save what is had or must from you be took. So I don't want any other delights from you. I don't want any other delights from you at all. Despite what happened in sonnets 40, 41, and 42, which seem to be a veritable smorgasbord of love delights. Now the narrator is saying, I want no other delights from you, save from what you can give me. And then the couplet. Thus do I pine and surfeit day by day, or gluttoning on all, 
or all away. And here we have the opposition again, the um, pining away as if to be all alone, surfeiting, gluttoning, um, or all away possessing nothing. So the idea of having everything or having nothing. But also, um, this idea of I famish for you, and of course we have to think of dear dirty Stephen Booth when we see the word all, because all is often a term for genitalia. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't know why I choked up on that one. A term for genitalia. Um, gluttoning on all or all away. So you've got it or you don't have it and, and you want it all the time. Seems to be what's happening here. So there doesn't seem to be any indication to me whether the narrator or the beloved is a male or a female. The miser here is male. Um, the idea of twixt a miser and his wealth. So the miser is designated as a male and so possibly the narrator identifies with the miser and is also a male but it's not necessary. It could be a male or a female um, as the beloved could be as well. Dramatically speaking, where might it fit into Shakespeare's work? Edmondson and Wells have helpfully pointed us in the right direction by saying that it could be a sonnet that is exchanged between Lorenzo and Jessica in The Merchant of Venice, between Helena and Demetrius in Midsummer Night's Dream, or between Helena and Bertram in All's Well That Ends Well. Now, narratively, where are we in terms of how this might fit into what we've seen from the first 74 sonnets? Sonnets 1 through 17 is a dispassionate, somewhat urging of the narrator for the beloved to procreate. Sonnets about 18 to about 42 is a passionate wooing with a waxing and a waning in the relationship. And I'm sort of fighting between whether it's the pen or the penis that drives the narrator's efforts. Um, there's a lot about the poet's poetic powers as the honey trap or the amber that will sort of trap them and immortalize them both. Then from sonnets 43 to 51, it seems like there's a separation and a return. From 52 to 60, reunited and it feels so good. And in this last series that we've been looking at this season from 61 to 74, this may be kind of a stretch, but I could make an argument that they do seem separated all throughout, and that with 75 they seem to be speaking directly to one another, although we only have one side of the conversation. And if I were an ambitious young poet, spoiler alert, I'm none of those things, but if I were, I would write a 155 sonnet cycle as the beloved that would turn Shakespeare's 154 sonnet cycle into a dialogue between the beloved and the lover. Similar to the way Liz Fair did with her album Exile in Guyville, which supposedly answers song by song, um, the Rolling Stones' exit on, Exile on Main Street. So for any of you poets out there, young and ambitious and willing to take this task up, go for it. Just credit me in your, in your book and um, I'll take 5% of the royalties. Thank you. So back to the matter at hand. I will go out on a limb here and say that I'll pronounce that the lovers are reunited in Sonnet 75 um, after rather going through the mill, perhaps surviving a pandemic-like plague. I wonder what that must be like. And as for the plague, the word plague shows up 107 times in Shakespeare's work. And there were, we have to remember, five major outbreaks of the bubonic plague in London during Shakespeare's lifetime. So that might inform these sonnets and whatever saga this particular ordering of them might tell. And I don't think that I am over-egging the pudding as Roz from Scandinavia scaly dandling about the books 
would say, I don't think I'm over-egging the pudding by inserting the possibility of plague as an agent of separation and reunification in the possible narrative of this sonnet series. We all know the trials and tribulations of living through a pandemic, and whatever trials and tribulations you may be going through or whatever tragedies or difficulties you may have witnessed, I do hope that the awareness of the, those tragedies also makes you aware of all the good things in life that are around us all the time, even through these troubled times, and that those good times can be a balm for you. And I hope that you are keeping yourselves safe and healthy, or at least aware and um, relatively happy. And I want you to know that wonder does continue to abound in your world. Pay attention. Until we meet again, I am Too Tight with Trek. Mwah.